have an agenda. Okay, if I could uh, call a meeting to order, our regular meeting for April 8th, 2013. And look to the town clerk to roll call. Chairman Walsh. Here. Council Guvenali. Here. Council Jordan. Here. Council Ray. Here. Council Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. And Councilor Wagner. Here. You'd all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Is there anything? Any reports from anybody? No. So yes, Frank. So Go ahead. You mentioned that on Friday. Uh, at 9.30 a.m. we'll be having our first uh, library committee meeting. Um, <coughs> we will open up the new discussion of what our plans will be for the library. So we have a full committee on that. It's on the town website, so everyone can see who's on, on the committee. Great. Good. Um, and I uh, appreciate uh, Jay's work on getting that up, and also, Frank, your suggestion on how to get everybody on the same page in terms of uh, the calendar. What's it called? Doodle? Doodle. Doodle. Yeah. Doodle. That's the uh, calendar the format that he used. Thank you very much. Any other uh, reports or correspondence? We did receive a letter relative to Wednesday night's um, presentation from the school board, and I'm going to have Deb Lane um, scan that and send each of you a copy. Uh, it was just there was just one hard copy addressed to the town council, and I thought everybody ought to have a copy. Great. So next item on the agenda is the monthly financial update. Either Michael or Frank, anything? OK, I um, prepared a um, graphic which is intended to give us some perspective on um, capital spending uh, for the town, the municipal side of the town. And it's really prepared as a backdrop for our discussions that we'll be having over the next month or two about future um, capital investment planning. And I thought that. Um, all this data is, has been available publicly. I thought I'd put it in a format that made it a little bit easier to understand and perhaps to digest and perhaps will uh, give us an opportunity to um, have some context when we're looking forward, both in terms of uh, how much we're spending, what we're spending it on, and how we're financing it. And what the graphic represents is, is um, basically capital spending going back to 2000. Uh, to 2000 and it's from 2000 to 2014. I've clumped it into five-year segments because with, with capital spending, it's really long-term in nature. Looking at individual years doesn't give you a, a, a great picture necessarily, so I clumped it into five-year segments. And I uh, organized it by major categories that um, Mike uses in terms of uh, budgeting, including building improvements, roads and sidewalks, uh, equipment vehicles, land improvements, and, and things like that. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail on this. I'm really introducing it as a way for folks to start thinking about this and be prepared for our, our future discussion. Um, and so three points I'd make on this. Number one, we should be thinking about capital spending sort of in two buckets, and that is that capital spending that we are doing on an annual basis that comes out of our annual budget, and that capital spending which is funded through bonds, or in the case of the pathway, through grant. The second thing is that you can see from this chart that there have been periods of very high capital spending relative to other years. I mean, not high relative to what the town can afford, but bump ups that have occurred in various uh, periods of time uh, when things have been needed. And on the table, you can see that in the 2000 to 2004 period, there are a variety of projects we undertook which were funded by bonds and which we've been paying down uh, ever since and have uh, been able to do this and maintain our credit credit worthiness at a very high level. And uh, the final point is that as we discuss the uh, future capital spending in the coming weeks and months, um, it's pretty clear that we need to continue investing in uh, facilities in town, in roads, and plant, and everything. And the likelihood is if we're going to be investing at an appropriate rate to maintain our facilities, that we're going to have to seriously consider doing bonding for the existing plant. This doesn't include live or anything. That's just for the existing plant and to maintain it at a, an acceptable level. So as we talk about 
our plans. We talk about the possibility of the library. We think about how this fits alongside what the school has to do. We'll need to think about this sort of a global perspective as to when we can issue bonds if we need to, how this will impact our taxes going forward. But I think it's very important for us to have a long-term perspective and have this a very inclusive, uh, inclusive view. That's it. David? Uh, Frank, this is really helpful. I was just wondering if there was a way to uh, add in columns to show what portion of the debt has been retired as of a certain time so that as right. we're planning ahead, we can, for example, if, if the bulk of the debt that was incurred from 2000 to 2004 has been retired, that just right. might be a helpful piece. Yes. To, I mean, I know that information's, I think, I believe it's out there already. Well, actually, I did a, a chart on that at the, la the last meeting, right. which is already on the website. Okay. Yeah. And it shows uh, it peaked when it, 88, Mike, or 2000? About that. I mean, 98, 2000. And it's come down dramatically. Right. So it gives you a very good picture of uh, where we can go from here and where we've been. Okay. And so if you go on the website, and I'm not sure. I found it tonight. I was, I was looking for it. I'm not sure what the link was. And, and I didn't know if there was just a way to maybe combine the two, uh, but maybe that's impossible. I just Well, when we, <coughs> as we discuss it, I'll make sure I have that available so everyone can see it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. It's, um, and this will get uh, published on the website as well? Yeah. Is that possible, Michael? Yes, it is. Okay, great. And we'll, we should put it next to the other one. That they, uh, yeah, so they can be about. compared. Maybe I'll, I'll ask Wendy to do a special section <clears throat> of monthly monthly finance committee <clears throat> chair reports. And there you go. We'll Good. put them there. Yeah, because we've had, citizens, we've had citizens come forward. There is a bit of mystique to all of this, and this kind of takes it and boils it down and makes it much more practical in terms of understanding exactly what we're talking about. But I think the, the larger issue is, as Frank indicated, that, you know, the, the current infrastructure, forget any additional, we, we need to be concerned long term that we make sure that we are good stewards of that asset. Um, so this sort of paints the picture, at least at least draws some, you know, some context around it for us as we go forward. Thank you. Any questions for Frank? Anybody? No? Um, yeah, Frank. I thought Jim, this is just an opportunity to review what the schedule is for the budget coming up. Uh, so folks are in tune to that. On Wednesday, April 10th, um, the school board budget presentation will occur to the town council. On the 11th, the uh, finance committee will have its wrap-up session and will set the budget for public hearing. On April 29th, uh, the town council uh, budget hearing, a public hearing will occur and the vote on uh, the budget will occur for the town council. And um, on May 14th will be the citizens' vote on the school budget. And just uh, uh, the summary of the budget is on the web, um, but at the moment, uh, the, what we'll be discussing on Wednesday evening um, and the rest of the week is the, uh, an overall budgeting uh, tax increase of 3.5%, uh, and, and that's comprised of 1.8% uh, for the municipal side and 4.0% for the schools. Hmm. Okay. Good. Is there any, Michael, any, uh, any additional comments relative to that? Or? I, I, it was Frank down. I wasn't, I don't want to take his time. No? You okay? Yeah, I'm Good. Fine, yeah. so I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what Frank said on a couple of things. First, on the, the CIP planning, it's been very helpful what he's doing. And, uh, you know, it's a continuing evolutionary process to, to do, you know, to look at what Dave Sherman's question and look at the debt. To look at this, but the one thing that was interesting, Frank asked about a month ago or three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, maybe, did we actually have a spreadsheet that showed everything we had spent in the CIP the last 10 years? And we didn't. Uh, so ended up, we, we, we put together a spreadsheet working from 20, from the year 2000, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very helpful data, and that's also, we'll, we'll post that, the, all the raw data as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you, you hear that we spent X amount on. Y project, and you actually look at the numbers, and d d d a lot of these are, are urban myths. Uh, and when you actually look at the numbers, it, it tells you what what we've really spent money on for the last 15 years, where the priorities have been. And I think it's uh, it's very helpful and useful to anyone who's who has interest in municipal finance. Second, uh, Frank mentioned where we stand with the budget, and just uh, this is the current pro forma as of uh, last Friday. Uh, the council uh, received last Friday or tonight your school budget. 
These are the very latest numbers. The, they just got another printout from the state. They lost a, about another 22,000 in revenue. Uh, that, was, that was unexpected. Uh, and, and the other number that the council really hasn't seen, you know, there's a couple things here. The community services was increased by just under $10,000, a decision the school board made from, from the original superintendent's budget uh, in relation to some issues and concerns about the fitness center. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the town services line, if you've read any of the newspaper articles, or it's always been referred to as a 2.4% increase, and it's now down to 1.9%. And that's because of three things. It's from uh, retirement in the police department. There's going to be some cost savings. Uh, there's savings from Eco Main as a result of a decision to lower even further the assessment. Uh, and, and the third piece is actually $16,485 of that's now in there. That's a record that emanates from a recommendation of the FOSF committee to have one penny for uh, land acquisition. So if you look at all of that, it's gone from 2.4% to 1.9%. And as Frank mentioned, the, you'll be meeting with the school board on Wednesday to review the school budget and the community services budget. And on Thursday, the council has a meeting at which the finance committee rec makes a recommendation to the council, and then the council actually sets them out for public hearing. So at that point, you'll have you know, one last chance before the public hearing to look at all you know, those changes I've just mentioned in the finance committee budget in the potential finance committee budget and make your decisions on what you want to set for public hearing. Any questions on that? This is a very good overview of the school board uh, presentation in, uh, on the website as well for those okay. that wish to get a jump start on that conversation. So thank you for that. Anything else, Michael? Yeah, a couple of things. I did want to uh, speak for a little bit about the Love It Is parcel. It's, it's an item that's in executive session later on. And I just wanted to be clear that the item in executive session relates to an offer that we've gotten for someone that owns 2.67% of the property. And I just want to point out what the Love It Is parcel is. It's uh, that little, it's the sort of middle left. Uh, there's a, it looks like an upside down Louisiana shaped parcel. Uh, that's about uh, 18 acres, and it's, it's got the bluish tinge to it. And over the course of time, through, through tax uh, foreclosures, as well as through obtaining donations from individual property owners or outright purchases from individual property owners, a combination, we've acquired uh, all but 2.7% of it. And the issue that will be discussed in the executive session is the offer from the person who is an offer from the person who owns 2.7% to to buy their interest. And I want to point out this map, and you know, there's a lot of talk about the green belt and what it accomplishes. If you look at this, is a key parcel. It's right in back of Sherwood Forest, but what's missing is a connection to the whole Oakhurst neighborhood. And if you, if you know, we eventually acquired, which has nothing to do with this 3%, but if we acquired that other piece in that neighborhood, and we've been having discussion with that, you then have the trail, which then extends all the way down. This is the, the, the RNG green is Robinson Woods, now at the top of the screen. Robinson Woods 2 is in the middle of the screen. And then at the lower part of the screen, you can see where Robinson Woods 2 ends, but then the land trust was just able to get an easement uh, from Kirk and Nancy Pond to almost bring uh, the green belt all the way uh, through land trust land, town land, easements, all the way, almost from the Oakhurst neighborhood to the center of town, on an inland through the woods. The only piece is that the only piece that's now missing is that little piece in Oakhurst. And the Conservation Commission is having continuing discussions on that. Any questions generally on on that particular issue? Good. The the other thing, and I apologize, it's going to take me a minute to call this up because we had internet problems. Uh, a minute ago. I, d 
did want to point out, now that April's here and we're beginning to get a, a lot of interest in the town's open space, uh, and there's a lot of questions and we get a lot of people come into the office of where is the green belt, what is the green belt, and I wanted to point out on the town website, you can see I just found this as easy as typing green belt in the search box, we have a green belt trails map, and you simply click on that, this shows, it doesn't show Robinson Woods 2 yet, but it shows all of the different trails in town. And you can also, on the right, a trail names and numbers. And for example, if I hit Gullcrest Trail, you can then, it, it zeroes in with, with a map like that. You hit Lodge Review, and there's a map on the trails of the Gullcrest property. So, you know, anyone who's looking to, this is a great time, the, the uh, I don't believe the deer ticks are out yet, the mosquitoes aren't out yet, but anyone, you know, that wants to explore all the different trails, you know, this is really a great time to do it. And if you can see, you know, throughout the town on, on, this, uh, on this map, you can see just the extent of trails there are and, uh, you know, between the town's acquisitions over the years and land trust acquisitions. So I sort of call this the month of the green belt in terms of, uh, to me, along with the fall uh, after the mosquitoes have died, uh, to me it's some of the best time to explore that, uh, that area. Uh, third, I wanted to mention that the refuse disposal area is going to be open the next four Sundays for disposal of leaf, yard waste, and recyclables. Uh, that is from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So anyone that has a little yard work that, wants, that they want to do and wants to use the recycling center uh, transfer station uh, for leaf and yard waste and recyclables, it will be open the next four Sundays from April 14th to May 5th. And finally, I wanted to mention that uh, beginning this past week, citizens and other interested parties can now apply for building permits and other permits online. Uh, this would include uh, a, a permits that can be applied online, include accessory use home occupation, building permits, demolition permits, electrical wiring permits, electrical service permits, heating permits, plumbing permits, short-term rental permits, uh, the sign permits and subsurface wastewater disposal system. There's a couple little kinks in the system. Uh, it's just getting started. People can pay these permits by credit card, uh, and uh, and you know we, we we will be processing them and issuing them. But you know it's it's more and more of the direction that we've been moving in the last few years of, of trying to be able to do more and more online. And that that went live last week. And I want to thank all of those staff members who are involved. Aniko uh, Verity, particularly in the code enforcement officer, Ben McDougall, our new code enforcement officer, Deborah Lane, who makes sure that the money comes in, it goes into the right, uh, right places. And uh, Bruce Smith also was involved early on in uh, helping to uh, get this process started. So I want to uh, thank them and indicate that, uh, you know, I think this is a real step forward to finally have this uh, service online. That's my report for the month, thank you. So we went out of order. But did you have anything else? Is it no, that's it. Report, sir? No, okay. Um, so now we have our first opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to the council? If you do, please join us at the podium and tell us your name and your address. And uh, Nobody? Okay. All right. This is a, anything that's not on the agenda. Is that okay? All right. All right. So we'll move to the next item, which will be review the minutes of March 11, 2013. I have a motion. Jessica? I move that we accept the minutes of March 11, 2013. Seconded. Frank? All those in favor? Mm. Unanimous. Thank you. First item on tonight's agenda, item 50. Uh, this is a proposal regarding the building permit issuance notifications. And I guess we'll look to our chair of the ordinance committee, Kathy Ray. Okay. Um, do you, I mean, other than what you have presented, do you want me to summarize or? Well, you can give some background and then uh, okay. and make a motion. Um, whatever. Well, we had, um, we had three meetings and we went over um, the different um, ideas. Um, ben. Our new uh, code enforcement officer was there, was very helpful. Um, and uh, we discussed um, all the different um, options about uh, and the things that people had talked to us about in terms of 
setbacks, 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, 500 feet. And one of the things that um, I think was important was that Ben had um, indicated to us that a 50-foot perimeter would um, encompass the, um, all the buildings that directly surround um, a building, including the ones that are across the street. Because I know we've had a few people that have asked the question um, and that they did not feel that, that, was, that 50 feet would be enough. And um, Ben seemed to think it was, and it was also consistent with what they had been doing at his prior employer. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's something else. Did, did you folks think something else? Yes, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I think the overarching uh, goal of the Ordinance Committee was that abutters would receive notice when a building permit is issued. And so what Kathy was explaining was, okay, which abutters <coughs> will get it. Right. And, uh, and so I, I think, assuming we forward this to the Planning Board, the, the, a major issue that the Planning Board will have to grapple with, which we did as well, is, is it going to the folks who are within 50 feet of the property line? Is it going to go to the closest 25 abutters? I mean, there, there are uh, several ways you can look at this. And I, I think that the Planning Board will hear more on that topic um, from the folks who have been affected by some of the controversy we've seen in the Shore Acres neighborhood. As, and they'll hear from the, the CEO as well as Maureen. So I don't think anybody in the Ordinance Committee was that wedded to a particular formula, we felt that what we recommended would provide adequate notice, but I'm sure we'll hear more from the planning board. Right. Now, we thought that was, was a very reasonable step to take. And again, uh, we were assured that 50 feet would, um, would cause notification to all abutters, including those across the street. So. And I think one other piece was um, that Maureen had gone through with us is the, um, the notification process and depending on how many feet we went out, how many notifications would have to be sent and what kind of staff time and, and cost would be associated because our recommendation does not pass the cost along to um, the uh, person who's getting the building permit, but if we started looking at a wider sweep. Mm -hmm. um, we started looking at some bigger um, costs associated with that, and, and so we, we talked a little bit about and who was going to bear those costs. Um, so, mm -hmm. as David said, um, we, you know, this is what we're recommending that goes to the planning board, and then they can, um, you know, take a look at that and see um, what they think. But, you know, I have to thank um, Ben and Maureen because without their input and their understanding of you know past information um, I don't think we would have been able to get to a, a point where we we felt comfortable to recommend it going forward so I'll entertain a motion oh I'm, yes. I'm, and we, we'll, we'll take a second and then we can we can add questions okay. after that. Um, then I would like to move that we um, we send our, our proposal for the building permit issuance notification to the planning board second second David Okay, any questions? Jamie? Yeah, um, my understanding of what was happening in Shore Acres is that <clears throat> there could have been more property owners that would be affected by a notice than just a 50 foot radius. Um, we received some correspondence with them from Sheila. Um, and given that there's property rights due to easements across the entire subdivision of Shore Acres, I think 50 feet might be inadequate to give a proper, proper notification to all interested parties in the neighborhood. You know, just, uh, I mean, a, a comment, um, you know, part of this is, uh, is a result of uh, people uh, not having the, the ability to appeal the building permit in a timely fashion. Um, so there's a lot of disclosure here that's uh, being trying they're trying to clean that up a little bit and uh, be a little more uh, a little more uh, upfront about it in the first place the planning board obviously is going to take this whole subject um, up and uh, more than likely will have its own public hearing and then of course depending upon what they come up with it'll come back to us and then of course we'll go through the process as well and have to put it to a public hearing as well so there'll be ample time for people to weigh in but I mean I, I don't know I think I've I don't think about four emails on the subject, and uh, 
we go from the 50 to upwards to 200 feet. And then the whole issue about people across the street versus on the side in which the permit might in fact be issued. So I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the planning board will, will reconcile this for us and give us their opinion. As you can hear from the three meetings these folks had, it was varying points of view about that. Right, and, and I think just to make the point again that Ben had assured us, because we talked about the 50 feet, and we talked about 100, and we talked about 150, and 200, and Ben assured us that 50 feet would in fact cover people across the street, because I think mm -hmm. there were many folks that felt that it would not, but Ben indicated that it would. So mm -hmm. I think that's where we started to feel comfortable that 50 feet yeah. would, would do the would job do the at least. Yeah. 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 Thoughts? Dave? I, and, but I certainly appreciate Jamie's comments. I appreciate the comments we've received from people who have been directly affected by it. As I said, I don't, at least I speak for myself, I don't think I was that wedded to 50 feet. It seemed to make sense based on our deliberations. But I think it's going to be further explored by the planning board. And if they come back with something that appears reasonable, yeah. I'd, I'd be willing to support that. Yeah. Jessica, you make yeah. yeah. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see what the planning board comes up with. One of the, one of the, uh, reasons we decided on 50 feet, to my recollection, was that it does, in <coughs> fact, cover all abutters, including those across the street. And you do get, if you go beyond that, you get into the, where, do, where the heck do you cross the line? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 200? Is it 500? And the concept was that the people that are direct abutters are the most interested, most likely, in, in a very common sense approach to what is happening. And of course, you know, they will likely talk to other neighbors, you know, if, if there is an occurrence that is troubling someone. And, and we did address the timeliness True. issue, which was one of our, our big issues. Yep. Um, but, you know, you, you can, I think it's, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on this and you want to be careful that you don't just have a situation where somebody who's, you know, a few streets over and, you know, whatever. I mean, it doesn't seem always appropriate that that individual would have the same interest as a direct abutter. So it'll be interesting to see how the planning board handles it. Frank, made a point? Yeah, just a question. What events trigger notifications that go way beyond that? I mean, I've, I've had notifications um, for uh, buildings that have occurred a great distance from my home, and I'm curious, what, what's sort of the threshold when that, that benefit occurs? Well, zoning has a, the zoning board um, has a rather deliberate notification process. And uh, depending upon, obviously, you know, where, where your property ended and some other property started, especially where you are, there was some development offshore road that would come in around the backside of where you are. Right, um, but so way that, 50 feet. Right, and that, and that w would have been an abutter. Um, but there's a rather deliberate process. In fact, if you've watched the last couple of zoning board meetings, the zoning board members have made it very clear to Ben they want to make sure that they understand exactly who's been informed because they really, you know, they feel very strongly that that's, that's an important part of the process. So I'm not sure what else there is, Michael. Is there another, are there any other? Is, yeah, I think you, you've hit some of it, but some of it is controlled by state law and uh, sh shoreland zoning issues uh, and zone changes. For, for instance, require more of a notice than a zoning, a simple zoning board action. Mm. It, it varies by the law and by the by the individual ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. David, because right now we don't have a notification requirement for the issuance of a building permit, if somebody wanted to monitor that, uh, in other words, if they were concerned that uh, a building <coughs> permit could be issued three properties away, uh, I've forgotten. Are they are the issued building permits posted online by the CEO so you could check every two weeks just to make sure you're not missing your chance to uh, file an appeal? Yeah. yeah. If you go into, uh, under the website Government Departments Code Enforcement, there's a, there's a uh, link to recent building permits. And right now they have the permits, well they happen to have them listed April <coughs> 1 through April 8th. Uh, but you know, people need to go look. They, I believe they can, they can subscribe to an RSS feed to that page when right. it's updated. But I, you know, right now they seem to be, you know, for example, April 1 to April 8th is updated, but it looks to me like the previous update was March 1 to March 31st. So it's, it's not following near as I can tell the exact pattern. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
Call a vote. All those in favor of moving this to the planning board? Unanimous. Yeah. Jim. Thank you. Just, yes, if I might, and I don't know. In March, maybe someone in, in the audience knows, but I don't know if, if it was just aggregated into a month that a whole month's report or if it was originally there week to week. I don't know that. So that's I, I don't want to mislead anyone. But sure. I do know that it, as it now appears, there's one report for all of March and there's another one for the okay. first week of April. Yeah. David. I, I, I recognize some folks who are here tonight that have spoken with to the Ordinance Committee, and I didn't know if they wanted to speak tonight. I mean, it's not a public hearing, but do we do well, I mean, allow typically for folks to It depends speak? on how people feel about it. I mean, certainly if they'd like to come up and talk to us, they would be more than happy to listen to you. If you don't have anything to say, that's fine, too. We won't take it personal. <laughs> if you could uh, tell us your name and your address, that'd be great. Thank you. I'm Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trundy Road in Shore Acres. Pull the microphone down there. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, and I just had a few <clears throat> comments, and I know that you have pretty much covered the ground on, on this. Um, but one concept that I think is overarching uh, in this is that um, the residents of Cape Elizabeth are the ones who have to police the enforcement of the zoning code when it comes to permits being issued by the code enforcement officer. It's not the zoning board and it's not the planning board. It's the citizens who actually have to know when a permit is being issued because if there is a question of the legitimacy of the permit, then there are the 30-day appeal rights that go into effect. But if they don't know about it, if they're not notified about it, how is our process supposed to work? That, I think that's an overarching issue, why we have notification in the first place. So that's why we need that notification um, process. Now, with the 50-foot um, suggestion, I believe it is too limited. Uh, I remember when I had to go before the zoning board for a variance on when I lived in Wabin, and um, everybody on the block got a notice of that hearing, and they showed up, and I thought, oh my God, this is going to fail. Well, in fact, it helped me out. They were so supportive. They knew about it. They appreciated it, um, and it's about... Uh, being involved in what's going on in our community. Um, having a 50-foot radius is too limiting. Uh, and it really calls into question whether or not um, there's actually sufficient due process in, in something like this when the citizens are actually the ones enforcing the code. I mean, that's my take on it. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, go ahead. I'm Jim Moore from five, <coughs> excuse me, five Wombat Road. And I am in favor of permit notification. Building permit conflicts between neighbors are best resolved early and before significant construction occurs. Permit not notification facilitates early resolution. I would like to see notification increased from the proposed 50 feet to something larger, maybe 200 feet or so. I know of three permit appeals in my neighborhood over the last six months that included appealers that were greater than 50 feet from the building permit property. Building permits take a significant amount of effort. First of all, you gotta pay $150, then you gotta go through that 200 and how many, 240 some odd page document to figure out which codes maybe were not followed. And then you gotta go to the ZBA, which isn't any fun. But as these neighbors and these three permits that are greater than 50 feet actually went through with that process, I conclude that in at least three appeals in my neighborhood over the last six months, neighbors greater than 50 feet from the building permit property are impacted by those building permits. In summary, I'm in favor of building permit notification. 
I would like the notification to be increased from 50 feet to something larger, maybe 200 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Chairman and uh, Councilors. Thank you very much. My name is Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. And first of all, I wanted to thank the Ordinance Committee because they have they work very hard on all issues, and they really have done a thoughtful job with this, and also our town planner and our code enforcement officer. I, too, am very pleased that notification of building permits is being considered, and I totally support it. And along with Sheila and Jim, I support a, a wider reach. I don't think 50 feet is enough, and, and I went up after one of the, the last ordinance workshop with Elizabeth Sarage from 38 Trendy Road, um, Reef Road, excuse me, and um, we actually got a tutorial on the GIS mapping system, which is really cool, it's great. So we were able to pick addresses, some of which were impacted recently, such as mine, and we were able to put 50 feet in, 60 feet, 100 feet, 50 feet uh, for the situation that I was in at my address wouldn't have given notice to anybody other than um, myself, three, three people, three homes. And I'm across the street from the home that was um, doing the building, had a building application. And then it would have notified the person beside them and just one person um, beside me. But actually, my neighbor to the right would have been impacted more than we would have been, and they wouldn't have been notified. So, so 60 feet brought them in the fold. Then we put 100 feet in, and it didn't change anything. It just brought them in the fold, and nobody else was notified. And then we went to Surf Road um, down near the park. Um, yeah. And we did the same thing, and very similar results. A little bit more, I don't know the, I can't remember the address, but Ben and um, Maureen would. Uh, um, but when you added 60 feet in, in that case, it brought in one more. And when you did 100 feet, it brought in two more for a total, I think, there of seven. And in our case, so then it only brought in one more for a total of four. So I don't know what the number is. Um, I, I agree with all of you that I think when the planning board looks at it, um, they have a lot of experience with this, that they'll come up with something. But it feels like 50 feet is, is too limiting. So thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to talk to us? You're the only one who hasn't. <laughs> no, she said it on Now, we didn't allow do-overs. Um, I, I, I forgot to say something. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I was looking for Elizabeth to come up. Um, That's fine. What I, what I, I don't know how the process works or if you could recommend anything different to the planning board. I just don't yeah, know how that this works. Is, they're an independent um, citizen group. And the whole the process is the way it's gone up to now. We're giving it to them. And they're going to look at it with open ears, open minds, open eyes, yeah. and come back to us with what they think. Okay. And that's really in everybody's best interest. And I think in a few minutes here, you're going to hear the chairperson of the planning board present something to us that went right. to them. Right, the subdivision. And it looks very different yeah. than when we gave it to them. So I think that. Right. Well, I, the only thing that I, would, I wanted to mention is that in terms of consistency, um, keeping in mind that it would be a good idea if the notification radius were the same in all three area uh, process areas, the uh, planning board notification, the zoning board notification, and then this. It could be all the same, 500 feet, 200 feet, whatever it is, so everybody knows what it is. Uh, so that's that's the only thing I wanted to raise. It seemed like it would be an easier, it would be an easy solution. Um, but I, Mike, Michael yeah. indicated, Sheila, a minute ago that there are state laws, there are shoreland issues that dictated a very different process. So, you know, I think that it, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and again, we periodically go back and look at our ordinances as a town to make sure that we're current and appropriate and we're doing the job that we need to do, but it's an interesting thought, and you have the benefit of having the chair of the planning board listening to you tonight. 
So before they start their deliberations, she's got a heads up as to some of the thinking out there. Well, thank you for letting me do a redo. <laughs> okay, that's a do-over. Great. Shirley, you're not interested in talking to us, obviously. I mean, I, she's not interested. You're not interested. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next item on our agenda, and um, that is uh, the amendments to the subdivision ordinance. And we have uh, the chair of the planning board, Victoria Volant, to speak with us, which is part of a protocol we put in place last year to have the respective boards come and give an overview of what's being presented for a vote. Thank you. I am Victoria Valent, and I am a member of the Planning Board, and I am here tonight to present the proposed amendments to the subdivision regulations. The current subdivision regulation was adopted back in 1968, and it's only been updated a few times in the last 45 years. When the comprehensive plan was updated in 2007, there was an implementation step number 87, and it recommended that the Planning Board overhaul the subdivision ordinance to align state and local subdivision standards of review and that is what the Planning Board has done. In addition to aligning standards of review, the new subdivision ordinance has also made information easier to find. It improves organization and readability of the document. The town engineer and the public works director have also reviewed road construction sections and they've recommended some changes that reflect current construction practices. And lastly, the uh, major subdivision review submission list. This has been changed. It, it allows more conceptual planning at the preliminary stage. So the benefit of this change is you can exchange more information between the applicant and the planning board before the applicant has incurred costly expenses. The planning board worked on the subdivision ordinance during 11 meetings. We had a public hearing on March 29th, and the planning board did recommend that the new subdivision ordinance be adopted as a replacement for the current subdivision regulation. And the planning board looks forward to working with the town council as it reviews the new ordinance. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank um, Dave Sherman, um, our councilor, because this is one of his unfinished pieces that he wanted us to attend to. So it's coming back to you. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Okay, so I will uh, entertain a motion uh, to, um, to send the subdivision uh, proposal to the ordinance committee. Can I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. So moved. Anyone second that one? Frank, any discussion? So it's coming back to you, Kathy, and to your team. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much for the work of the planning board. 11 meetings, wow. That's, uh, that's a lot of time. We appreciate that very much. Any, any questions? Any comments? I, I guess I'm just so impressed with the work of this planning board, the work you all did last year on the short-term rentals, the work I'm sure you're going to do on the notification of building permits. Uh, lest anybody think that the planning board just sort of takes what we send them and rubber stamps it and sends it back without any thought, uh, that's just definitely not the case. There's a lot of expertise on that board and they always make what we propose better. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you on the building permits, but I also want to just thank you again, and, uh, as well as the rest of the planning board for the work you've done. Okay, um, let's move the question. All those in favor, unanimous. Thank you very much, appreciate you coming this evening. Item 52, the library building use policy. Library trustees have recommended some technical amendments to the library building use policy. It's recommended that the revised policy be adopted. Do I have a motion? Jessica? I move that we uh, accept the library building use policy item 52, 2013. Seconding. Kathy. Any uh, questions? It's a, if you read the policy, it's, it looks like it's, it cleans up a lot of administration and uh, some redundancy and, and things that no longer apply. Um, I don't know whether there's any, any reason to have Jay come up and speak to us about this. Any, any questions from the board? No? I mean, it, it, I, just to echo that comment, Jim, it looks like instead of community services or inserting facilities department, just to clarify who the right people are that you need to work with or consult with. So I didn't see anything. Anything clearing? No. too controversial here. Okay. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Unanimous. Item 53, propose, uh, proposal to eliminate most library overdue materials and fines. Again, this is library trustees have recommended that the council, town council accept a proposed modification of their circulation policy. Eliminating overdue fines for the Thomas Memorial Library collection while still keeping the damage of lost item policies in place. Interlibrary loans will still have late fees associated with them. <coughs> uh, do I have a motion? Jessica. I move that we accept item 53, 2013, proposal to eliminate most library overdue materials fines. Second, anybody? Second, Jamie. Uh, any questions? This is when we might call upon you, sir. <laughs> Frank. Uh, I guess in looking at the uh, numbers that are associated with the costs versus the uh, benefits of doing this, does that suggest that those costs are actually going to go away if we eliminate the, um, the fines? And therefore, we'll actually see a net benefit by eliminating the fines? I have suggested to the manager that if it is the will of the council, I will adjust my salary line so that, in fact, those hours go away so that there actually is a net savings to the town. I, I guess, from my perspective, as long as there's not a loss, I'm not so concerned about reducing the budget for that amount, but as long as it doesn't produce a lot, net loss, that, that makes sense to me. Thoughts? Oh, Jamie, right. we're first. Jamie? Go ahead. I was just going to say, Jay, you're going to give up at least 25 bucks a year just from me alone. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're hoping that the public relations value would be in excess of 25 bucks. It, it really would be. You hate to hear that bing bing every time you like give your card. Yeah. Jessica? Well, you know, in reading through the materials, which I'm, I'm sure everyone had a chance, I mean, there's some interesting things that occur, which are a lot of staff time um, to collect these. Um, so it's pretty staff intensive, and I, I've, you know, been hearing this at the trustee meetings. Um, and. Jay did a great job of researching and you know, querying other libraries to see what they have done. And it really does, and Jay could uh, support this, it really does seem to be a very positive and growing trend, um, public relations and so forth. And I thought the donation information was really interesting. People that maybe had a 25%, 25 cent fine, when you take the fines away, they had, there's a guilt jar. They put in a five dollar bill, say, oh, here, you know. So, I mean, some libraries found this to be quite the plus. And so, I, I just think that's fascinating, and I, I'm hoping that council supports uh, the will of the trustees in this. Thank you. Michael, you had a point? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing that with the finance chair, no, no debt increase. You know, you remove $6,500 in revenue, which is still in the budget. You know, it's not, it's not a make or break thing, that amount of money, when it comes to right. a you know, $30 million budget. Uh, you know, I, I asked the same question to Jay. Well, you know, I, don't, I don't believe these numbers for a second, that you, know, you just can't get rid of staff on a one-to-one -one basis because of, you know, they're not doing these little things that are a part of you know, right. three minutes of every hour. Uh, you know, I think, and I've had some discussion with Jay, that particularly as the library committee decides what, what's to do with the library, I think we have an opportunity in the next year or two to really look to see what we, what we need for staff in a library in, in the second decade of the 21st century. And that involves, you know, looking at more, pe more positions that, that are uh, focused on helping citizens to access technology, looking at positions to, to provide programs and providing, you know, less intensive on books, magazines, et cetera, and more intensive on what a library is. And, you know, I think over the next year, particularly as we become more aware of what the library is going to be in the future, uh, that we need to take a, a, a whole look at the staffing uh, to make sure that we're meeting the needs and, and that we have the right people in the right positions. And, uh, you know, for, for that reason, I, I don't think we should just cut this at this point. I think we need a much broader review uh, as, as the next year goes on. Frank, any further questions? Um, just one comment or question. I'm sure we'll get some complaints, but this isn't, um, we're, not, we're, we're not serving a fiduciary responsibility in not collecting fines. I'm sure we'll hear those complaints from some folks who think that people who keep the books out longer uh, should have to pay a fine. But regardless of that, um, 
I think the, uh, the, the guilt jar is a good idea, particularly if the money goes straight to the library as opposed to the town's overall budget, which it does now. Fines do, right? That's right. I've heard complaints about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> any other points? Any comments? Okay. Jay, any words of wisdom before we take a vote? Um, microphone. microphone? Since our folks from home can't hear you from the back of the room. Especially somebody who's sitting on a book that's probably overdue. <laughs> I, I think that the, the fact of the matter is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% of Minerva libraries right now do not collect fines. Um, and none of those towns have suffered um, from any undue consequences from that decision. Um, you know, I, I agree with Michael that um, certainly the entire way the library is staffed is, is subject to review. And, and I think he would, you know, say that at the moment I am in, in the process of doing um, an ongoing review. Um, I would say that, you know, part of my willingness to, you know, eat that $6,500 uh, is because I'm at a fortuitous moment in history where I have some staff requests for reduced hours that allow me to displace cost. Um, I would also say, you know, that the issue here is um, the question of management of, of that line. Um, you know, I respectfully beg to differ with Mike um, that it's a fairly direct cost benefits ratio in terms of whose time is being spent um, to manage those uh, fines. And it's a fairly uh, easy translation to say that if I'm not counting fines, I'm saving two hours a week um, because I know how much time my staff is actually spending counting money. Um, and I have a fairly good idea of how much money actually goes into the mix if all we're talking about is lost and replacement items. So I'm relatively sure that I can use relatively high paid staff people uh, make better use of their time uh, in other avenues that more directly serve the public. Um, and I, as I said, I think ultimately, fines were never there as a, um, revenue source. They were always there as a disincentive, uh, as a means of protecting uh, the library's assets. And it has been demonstrated in many libraries that they don't function that way. Um, you know, uh, when I was a kid, and with my first library card in Foxborough, Massachusetts, I believe the going rate was uh, a penny a day for a young person and five cents a day uh, for an adult. Um, the cost of a postage stamp at the time was about five cents. Uh, we are certainly not collecting 46 cents a day, um, so we haven't even kept pace with the U.S. Postal Service. So um, I think that you know, they, they don't function as they were originally intended to function, uh, and in fact they become a disincentive to library use. And that's the greatest single reason I can think of to make them go away. Yeah. Okay. Yes, if, if I might put out, we're talking a $762 yeah, so, yeah, we're not my, talking. My sense is, I, I just, my proposal is we keep the revenue in the budget and we keep the expense in the budget. We don't recognize the $762 loss in this. We, we don't add $762 to the budget. And, you know, to me, this is a pilot experiment. I hope it works. But, you know, if it, if it doesn't work, if people who had books, we get complaints that people can't get books because people are sitting on them, keeping them too long it gives us the ability to go back to uh, mm. the status quo. Good. Any further conversation? Okay, let's call a vote. All those in favor of the proposal? All those opposed? Unanimous? Okay, thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Good luck at your meeting on Friday. I look forward to it. Is that effective it. immediately? Beginning of the fiscal. Unless you wanted to go into effect immediately. I think the intention was the beginning of the fiscal. <laughs> I'm going to favor Jamie. Jamie's Jamie. got to come up with 25 bucks before you. <laughs> I get a really quick yeah. book. My daughter can start taking movies out again. There you go. <laughs> the online ones, after 14 days, you know, if this goes away, you can't read it anymore because it's gone. But, uh, okay. Could Moving on. Yes, Michael? Just if I might, <clears throat> I don't see in the policy 
where there's an effective date for this. So I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that we had, the council adopts the policy and it, it just sets up the library staff for more fights and complaints and arguments about fines. So, you know, what I'd like to do is have a further dialogue with Jay on this and have the flexibility to put in an effective date. Uh, again, the, the, the revenues in this fiscal year aren't going to be such that. And, you know, if, if all those issues are already in place that Jay so vehemently says that we're, we're wasting high paid staff counting pennies, why wait to July 1? Yeah. Do you want a motion for that? I, I think we can just have a consensus that you adopt the policy and the staff can can be flexible on the effective date as long That's as it's fine. not later than July 1. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Make sure the minutes are yeah. like that. That's great. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Item 54, are the Appointments Committee recommendations. Jessica? Uh, yes. Um, do we need, we need a motion first for discussion? Um, you can make a motion and then okay. uh, include the names in it or have you see fit. Right. Um, I uh, move that we approve the Appointments Committee recommendations, item 54, 2013, <clears throat> and they are for the Newtown Center Plan Committee. And uh, the uh, recommendations are Stephanie Carver, 40 Stony Brook Road, Diane Hessler, 17 Canterbury Way, Skip Murray, 20 Grover Road, Stephen Parkhurst, 21 Oakhurst Road, and Lee Ruddy, 1 Birchwood Road. I have a second. Kathy Ray. Discussion? Jessica? Yeah, I would like to thank um, fellow counselors, Caitlin Jordan, Frank Governelli, and Jamie Wagner for the, the time we spent um, reviewing applicants and interviewing applicants. As always, we are very fortunate in Cape Elizabeth because we have outstanding citizens who apply to, uh, and to serve the town. We have, as this time and uh, is so often the case, more applicants than positions available, so it's always difficult to make our selections. We have wonderful people that apply. So I want to thank everybody, those who were chosen and those who weren't, because it's difficult to put all this together, but we are so lucky to have great citizens. What perked their interest? Did they come off the ad in the newspaper or the website or word of mouth or well, watching us on television? It's hard to say, but most of the applications came in after the courier. We had a few in the beginning, but most of them came in after seeing uh, the article and uh, the uh, you know, request for applicants in the courier. Interesting. Well, just curious what happened. Jamie? I just want to say, I, I thought you know, we had a wonderful field of applicants, and uh, I wish we could have chosen them all. They all brought something to bear, and uh, so we appreciate everybody that applied. Good. Second that. Yeah. Third that. So we, we four people who were impressed. Well, again, we're fortunate to have that kind of talent in the community who want to step up and help us with the plans that we have in place. So um, any, um, any further conversation around the recommendation on the table? All those in favor of unanimous? Thank you, Jessica, Caitlin, F Frank, and Jamie. Appreciate that. Okay. And next item on the agenda. Okay. Charles Road Sewer Rehabilitation Project. Project that's item number 55, and I'm going to turn this one over to Michael. Yes, uh, thanks, Jim. <coughs> this is a a project that was originally due to be done in the about five or six years ago, and we we did a lot of different sewer work and related road work at the time, and uh, we ran out of money when the bids came in, and this was one that was was not done. Uh, it, it's not inexpensive. The engineer's estimate is. Uh, $497,000, including uh, the project itself, uh, construction administration, uh, a 10% contingency, and it's proposed that it be funded $450,000 from the sewer fund and $50,000 from the infrastructure improvement fund. And if the council approves this, uh, you know, those allowances be set up. Uh, we're opening bids uh, in the next month, sometime, I think the 29th. I could be a little off on that date, and uh, we will be ready to award the bid. We did have a, a neighborhood meeting that we invited folks to last week, and uh, the citizens are really pleased on Charles Road, at least uh, 
the 10 or 11 citizens who came to the meeting uh, that this project is finally going forward. Can I have a motion? Frank, you have a question. I have a question. question. Mike, uh, historically, how close to um, budget or bids do uh, sewer projects come in? Are they, do they surprise us sometimes, or do they pretty, do we get pretty good bids that are in line? You know, I, I, I can't say they ever really surprise us. It all depends on where the market is at any given point. You know, when before the last recession, the, the inflation in, in road projects were, was just unbelievable. And then the recession hit, and it's a cost came way down. Right. And you know, it, 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 we should be by bidding in April, we should be out in front of quite a few bids, which which is positive. But, you know, if the contractors get their work lined up in season, and you put a bid out, you're not going to get a very good bid. But we're we're cautiously optimistic. But you know, I I have reason to believe the engineer's estimates are probably fairly accurate. Okay. I have a motion. Dave? Uh, I move that we approve the use of up to $450,000 from the sewer fund for replacement of the sewers on Charles Road and for related road improvements, and to allocate up to $50,000 from the infrastructure improvement fund for the same project. We have a second. Jessica? Mm -hmm. Any conversation? Any discussion? How long is this project going to take? Uh, six weeks, maybe, once it starts construction. Six weeks. Okay, great. We hope to have it done by August 1. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Item 56, the successor lease for building 324 at Fort Williams Park. Michael? Yeah, we've been very fortunate to have Family Crisis Shelter Services have their administrative offices in one of the two offices row buildings at Fort Williams Park for, we're not sure exactly if this is 20 or 25 years, uh, we didn't go back to see when the original lease was, but uh, you know, as you can see, uh, we get between right now it'll be about thirteen hundred uh, dollars a month. They pick up their own utility costs beyond that, uh, but it, it's good steady income uh, for the town. They're 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 a great tenant, and uh, we've enjoyed having them there all these years. Greg Marles uh, had, had the discussions with Lois Reckett, who's the the administrator of Family Crisis Shelter. Uh, on this particular lease. Good. We have a motion. Frank? Uh, move that we approve the lease to the Family Crisis Shelter for the buildings at, uh, building at Fort Williams that they lease. Second. David? Second. Second. All those in favor of the lease? I, I, oh, question, 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 question. Sorry. Michael, do you know what the square footage is on that? I don't know. It's a very odd building. You know, you go in. The, the back door, you're in an old-fashioned little kitchen. There's a closet off to the left, and there's really only two rooms, two and a half rooms on the first floor, a little entry hall. And then upstairs, uh, you know, there's a lot of stairways, a lot of, uh, you know, there's like, you know, the up to the second floor is maybe three rooms, and then there's a bit of an attic space, and I'm not even sure how they're using the attic space at this point. Okay. So is that a, is that a, something that Greg could supply to the council? Yeah, it, but I think it's important you really look at mm -hmm. functional square footage yeah. as opposed to actual square footage. Yeah. It, they're, they're, it's an odd building. Right, yeah. Okay, any other questions? What is the rent currently per month? Excuse me? What is the, what is the rent currently per month? It's about 3% less than the proposal for the first year. Between the two offices row buildings, uh, it's about $51,000 a year in, in rent that we receive. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the lease? Unanimous. Thank you. And item 57, the appropriations request. Michael? Yes. Uh, there's a provision in the charter that says we can't exceed the appropriation for any department by, except by consent of the council. We're in technical violation of that today. Uh, with our legal bills. Uh, you know, I've, I've updated the council along the way that we had some issues and challenges there, but uh, I think when April 1st came along, it, it was, it's time to, uh, as we go into the last quarter, address the fact that, uh, you know, technically and legally, we can't pay any legal bills without an additional appropriation. Uh, you know, we've discussed previously, this mostly relates to uh, issues involving uh, a number of uh, Rule 80B 
appeals against the town in the code enforcement area. Uh, and looking at it, you know, my recommendation is you appropriate the original appropriation for legal services, which was 25000 and I'm recommending that you appropriate an additional $37,000, uh, bringing the, the annual budget for both le for to, to legal services up to 62. And this is part of a department, the, the way we have it, uh, that also includes audit services. And between the two of them, uh, proposing uh, that uh, the overall budget of the department uh, increase from 55000 to 92000 again, an, an addition of 37000 in addition, the general assistance budget, was, which helps out needy families, was budgeted at 28.6. Uh, as of a couple of days ago, we'd spent a little over 27,000. Uh, last month, the loan was about 5,000. Uh, it was an expensive month. Uh, so I'm hoping that with $9,000 additional, uh, it'll get us through to uh, June 30th. We're required to spend these dollars if the need's there, even if there isn't an appropriation, state law requires it. So, in summary, I'm asking for a revision and account difference 130 from 55,000 to 92, an increase of 37,000, and an increase in account 410, Department 410 General Assistance, uh, to uh, in that line up to 36,000. I have a motion. Move that, move that we approve the appropriations request, item 57, 2013. I have a second. Second, uh, second by David. Any any conversation, discussion, questions? Okay, um, Michael, uh, you you alluded to the fact that a lot of this was directly related to the to the zoning board issues, but were there are other expenses, legal expenses this year as well? Yeah, this per, is personal routine. matters. Pretty routine legal expenses. Okay. Yeah, there was there was you know a personnel matter that you know we had a severance agreement. There was some legal expenses involved with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, it was pretty routine. You know, if you'd like, I, I could always we could get out copies of every legal bill and uh, we'd be happy to show. I know uh, Jamie uh, when this first came up uh, did take some time and looked at the legal bills. But, uh, okay. It uh, you know happy to provide whatever information you'd like. And then um, if you could rem remind us, what are you proposing in this next budget year for uh, it, legal fees? It's just a $2,000 increase from last year. I'm hoping so 27, that... 27000 Yeah, I'm hoping that it moderates, you know, that we don't have a repeat of what we saw this year. Okay. But we still, we might have a little, you know, these cases go on for some time. We might, although most of the work, the briefs and all that happened, you know, early on. But we still, you know, we could have a little slip, slippage until next year for these issues to be resolved. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jamie. I think there's three still outstanding, two or three. Jamie. Yeah. Michael, on the uh, projected need, is that based on an estimate provided by the town attorney? No, it's based on my sense of where we are with those cases and the, uh, you know, trying to keep down other expenses. You know, today there was, there was an issue, you know, I referred to, I talked to Jim about it, referred to Tom on a constitutional issue, someone who was exerting certain constitutional rights to do something. And, you know, we're going to have those cases. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, we've always tried to keep down legal expenses, but, but I don't, you know, I don't want to be foolish and not ask for advice when we need it. And I think today was one of those examples. Uh, don't Sorry, want to do the wrong thing. Yeah. No. Good. Any other further, further discussion on this? All those in favor of the motion on the table? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item 58, the annual renewal of river herring rights. Did you Just brief. This used to come to the town as alewife harvesting, but the, the state's changed the letter. I did receive a call today from Claire Enterline, the woman who wrote the letter to us asking if the council was going to do this. And she did tell me that the, the thinking of making alewives uh, an endangered species. And uh, even though we'll have the rights, they won't allow us to utilize them. Uh, but they still recommend that we uh, that we uh, renew our right. Interesting, Caitlin, did you? Oh, I was I was going to wait to comment that maybe we, as a town, could look into or help move along the state level to help allies here in town. Is that the allies? 
Brooks Farm, we noticed that there's very few owlwives left in the brook that runs along our property, and it seems as if the state would just dredge the brook and make it a little deeper. The owlwives could actually swim up the brook where they need to go to the great pond to spawn. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's a pretty easy fix that they just mm -hmm. don't want to do. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There was actually there was a big hearing in Augusta, I think, this past week on the St. Croix River. There's major issues in, in terms of yeah. gale wife protection. But anyway, this just sets us up to, as we've done for about 15 years, that uh, if there was a harvest yeah, and allowed, the, the town would have the right to manage it. Right. And the language in here for the, the ordinance, proposed ordinance, is no different it's, than anything we've had. It's in the past. past that's right. Yeah. Okay. Do so I hear a motion? Yes, Jessica. I move that we approve item 58, 2013, the annual renewal of river herring rights. I have a second. Second from Hale Wife's farm. <laughs> Caitlin. Okay, any, any questions for the manager or? Yes, David. I mean, this seems pointless, but uh, 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 stating the obvious, uh, but I don't see the harm in approving it, so I'll vote in favor of the motion. I just I'm sort of scratching my head. Um, we just don't want to lose the right, so maybe I'll come back. Do, do they ever dredge streams? Oh, do they? Yes. That's done. But they don't seem to, I mean, they just spent lots of money putting in new culprits and weirs to help them. And, the, the brook level is so low, like when I was growing up, we could row a boat. Our parents required us to have life jackets. It was so deep. Now, I could walk across it with shoes on. I mean, the fish just, they're flopping on the, the rocks. They just can't make it up the brook. So. Mm -hmm. So, have any further conversation? Jamie? I want to, is it? How Caitlin pronounces it, or how Jim pronounces it? Owlwife or alewife? It's <laughs> neither. It's River Herring. <laughs> it's River Herring. Name of the farm. <laughs> River Herring Farm. Coming from southern Massachusetts, it's called alewife. <laughs> Norwell, Hingham, that area. So, um, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. And we come to the next section, citizens' opportunity to discuss items not on the agenda and seeing no citizens in the room, we'll move on to item 59, which is a request for executive session. We'll entertain a motion. David? Uh, <coughs> I move that in conformance with Title I, Main Revised Statute, Section 4056C, that we enter into executive session to discuss a land acquisition matter. Do I hear a second? Jamie seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. We entertain a motion to adjourn now. No. Nope. We have to do that afterwards. So you won't be coming back on TV. I'm not going to come back on television. Thank you very much. And no action is contemplated. And no action is contemplated.